One of the biggest questions I get when patients come in the office and I talk about hip replacement is, what approach am I getting, right? And so there's, there's really lots of different ways that people can do hip replacement. The most common approaches that you probably hear about are a posterior approach um, and an anterior approach. There's also an anterolateral approach. There's also a direct lateral approach. There's lots of ways to do this surgery. And so what we're trying to do is take the procedure more towards a muscle-friendly type procedure. So traditionally with with an old school hip replacement, you did a posterior approach, the incision was really long, you took down every muscle you could find, you did the hip replacement, and ultimately patients did great. It's just the first two weeks were pretty crummy, right? And so we developed other techniques to try to help combat that. One of the current approaches out is an anterior hip that probably folks read about a lot on the internet, they hear a lot about. And that was the first step, you know, in the last 10 years or so, so trying to get more towards muscle sparing. Um, the other approach that people are using is what we call a minimally invasive posterior approach or a, what we call a direct superior approach. And so it takes a lot of the benefits of the anterior approach um, and hopefully mitigates some of the downsides of the anterior approach. And so, so one of the things with the anterior approach that's, um, that's a problem is the risk of fractures higher, the exposure's not quite as good, and ultimately there's some concerns over femoral loosening rates and uh, rectus and psoas hip flexor tendonitis issues. And so what we do with the direct superior approach is we, tr we do it muscle sparing to where we don't take down all the muscles that we did before. We do it through a very small six centimeter incision. And we don't have those same access issues or exposure issues that we do with the anterior hip. The other thing that's been uh, shown in data is that our rate of femoral stem loosening and our fracture risk isn't as high. And so ultimately what I would tell people is find a surgeon that you trust and do whatever approach they recommend. Because the reality is no matter, no matter how you cut it, when you look at all the science and all the data, both anterior approach and minimally invasive posterior approach have the exact same outcomes at six weeks. And now with the current generation direct superior approach, the really the results at two weeks are no different either. So one of the things that minimally invasive or direct superior hip replacement allows us to do is it allows us to get patients up and walking right after surgery and it lets us do them in the surgery center. Again, there's a driving force towards more outpatient total joint surgery. We know that the patient experience is better. We know that it's as safe as the hospital. And so we're really trying to find ways to allow patients to rapidly recover, get up and walk in, and basically walk on out the door and walk home, right? And so one of the things we do with direct superior approach is we don't take down the, the traditional muscles that we do with a, a, with a with a big posterior approach. It also allows us to be more soft tissue friendly and it allows us to do the, the hip replacement in a safe manner. And so by doing this, we're able to do joint replacement in the morning. Basically, as soon as the patient's spinal anesthesia wears off, about an hour, hour and a half later, the patient's up and walking with physical therapy and the patients are basically walking out of the surgery center. They're going home and they're already starting the recovery the night of surgery and then ther physical therapy the day after. So hip replacement historically has just been for older people, right? We were trying to get people into their 70s, they got a hip replacement, that hip replacement lasted 10 years and then you know, hopefully that got them you know, pretty close to the rest of their life. But the problem is as the, the population is becoming more active, the population is becoming more overweight and the population and older people are becoming more functional, we've really pushed the limits of hip replacement over the last 20 years. There's been the two biggest things that have really changed with hip replacement are number one, cementless technology, where we actually don't use cement anymore to get fixation. We use your bone, and your bone actually grows onto the components to give us long-term biologic fixation. The other biggest thing that's changed is the plastic. So about the year 2000, 2001, we got new plastic. It's called highly cross-linked polyethylene, and that's really been a game changer. So before with the old plastic, we started seeing at 10, 12, 15 years, the plastic essentially wore out, um, and it caused quite a bit of bone loss and bone destruction as it wore off, um, or wore out. And so what's really changed is once we got this new plastic, we didn't see the same wear rates. It's much more resistant to wear. And then the other thing is as it wears, your body doesn't handle it so poorly. So you don't get the same bone loss and bone destruction that you got with the old plastic. And so right now we're at 19 year follow-up and we really show minimal wear and we don't see the same type of osteolysis or that bone destruction that we saw before. And so this has really allowed us to push the limits in terms of age of hip replacement patients. You know, today in the United States, the average hip replacement age is 54, right? And so, you know, 
We all know those 50 something, 60 something year old, 40 something year old patients that are extraordinarily active, they have hip arthritis. And now with our current generation of implants, we're allowing them get to, to get back to a more active state. And we're hopefully giving them one re hip replacement that lasts them the rest of their life. You know, one of the unique aspects of my practice is I do young adult hip preservation and unfortunately that also means I do quite a bit of young adult teenager total hip replacements and obviously this isn't ideal but at least with our current generation of implants it gives those patients a shot at walking having a more normal life becoming more active and still not having the same level of damage and toxicity that was associated with the old type of hip components that we used.